Following down the, the next goal here would be increasing range of motion. And so patients with cerebral palsy tend to have limited range of motion. Stretching is usually a part of their overall treatment plan. Um, the statement really is, you know, bony growth has a really, really hard, I'm sorry, spastic muscles have a really difficult time keeping up in length with bony growth. So what are they combating? Typically when we're working with, with patients, why we, why we get involved with stretching type bracing and, and all of these, those modalities is because we're not trying to just catch up. We're not trying to gain a few degrees and then they grow. Then we gain a few degrees, or we lose a few degrees, then we try to catch up. The goal for us as orthodontists is we're trying to get completely ahead, to gain that full range of motion back. This is where we start having to look at our R1s and R2s. Um, it leads to more options available for day bracing. So lots of patients I see that come in the office that are limited range, we make them their brace for that day. But then I say to them, it doesn't end here. This is accommodating what's going on. It's accommodating that door stop. And what I say to the patients is, let's get rid of the door stop altogether. Let's let the door freely swing open. Let's let the joints completely move so that he has the ability to go through that door without all these impediments and all these, all these obstacles in his way trying to get through that door there. Um, so we'll start talking to the family from an or, from a, from a orthotic standpoint about static bracing. So we might use something that's more of a, more of a solid type nature type of brace. We might use something that's, uh, that's more of like a, a static progressive. So we got something that's more of a, a uh, more of a strapping type mechanism so that you can like the DAFO 9. Um, maybe I think what I'll do is I'll pass that DAFO 9 around at this point so we kind of start to get a feel for it. So static would be more something where we're dealing with it's, it's fixed in nature, you're holding them in a position to either maintain or even still trying to gain range with that. So I'll start that over here. Here's the DAFO 9. So this is more of your static progressive. So it's going after using stretching straps and those can be you know, incorporated into a DAFO 2. Lots of my patients what I do is I order a removable type strap and the removable type strap allows me, so when they come home from school, maybe in order to play the Xbox, or maybe in order to, you know, if they, if they like music, to play the piano, they have to put the stretching straps on in order to be able to do that activity. So they go after trying to gain more range of motion. Dynamic, you could be using springs in, your, uh, in the joints as well to try to gain some of that range as well. Um, increasing range of motion through the night stretching, so that's the DAF-09. Exerts a, a gentle stretch over time, used to increase or maintain the length of the Achilles, and knee immobilizers can help stretch the hamstrings. Oftentimes, we have kids wearing knee immobilizers with the ankle stretching, especially if we've got gastroc involvement on the, uh, on the tightness there. Uh, the reality of the day is really the, the big thing here. When I talk to parents about night stretching and stretching after, after school, um, the real key is there's a reality of the day is going on. And the reality of the day is parents have lots and lots of things going on. They have, that child has physical therapy appointments, has OT appointments, speech appointments, uh, clinic appointments with, with their, their physician, orthopedic appointments. Um, they may have piano, they may have soccer practice, they may have these activities, and they also may have other children that have all of these other activities going on as well. Um, we all in the room know we all have a reality of the day, and when, when you have kids, for instance, it is your reality of the day is how do I get everything done in such a short amount of time? I look, I look at my wife at night and I say, well, we made it. Everybody needed to get where they needed to be, and we didn't leave anybody anywhere. So successful day, successful outcome. So the goal here is in, in stretching is we go after trying to help them with gaining range of motion for one purpose, and that really is to help them with that reality of the day in the sense of to be able to put something on to give them that opportunity, that time to stretch. They might say, well, I didn't get six to eight hours out of it. I got an hour after school. That's an hour of stretching that they did that they wouldn't otherwise have had with that. So we're trying to get the best position of function when we're looking at this. It's a realistic heel and ankle alignment is what we're after. What is their realistic heel and ankle alignment? Do I force them to 90 degrees and let the midfoot collapse, or do I put them at minus 10 with a heel wedge underneath it and a nice, good, supported midfoot and using the program of gaining range of motion? Which of those options is going to lead to a better outcome for this patient, meeting the goals of, again, center of gravity and the base of support, and also protecting joints? Plantar flexion block or resist brace to prevent or reduce shortening of the Achilles and surrounding muscles. So when we're looking at best position, we're asking ourselves, do I want to resist the motion here, or do I want to stop the motion here? We're always trying to, with the Cascade DAFO system, trying to allow as much movement at the joint as possible. So, do we need to block the motion or can we go with resisting the type of motion? When I start talking about resistance, I may as well start sending these around as well. We talk about 
solid. I think all in the room are really familiar. Here's the guy we were just talking about in the slide there. would be somebody that would be set in, in plantar flexion, would have a big wedge underneath the heel to bring again, instead of being in this position because of the ankle angle, bringing the tibia forward by putting a wedge either on the shoe or on the brace. So I'll send this around this way as well. This is what's called a flexi sport. What's nice about this is there's different trim lines that allow these to be more rigid or more flexible in nature. Um, this is what they like to call the super 3.5. 3.5 was designed in, with in mind of working with patients. I'll send this one this way. Was working with patients that we just didn't want to give them free dorsiflexion. We still wanted to give them some resistance from falling into that dorsiflex position. Okay, so I'm going to send this around as well to this side. I'll send one of the flexi sports this way. This again is a 3.5, but you could call it kind of the super 3.5 in the sense of it's designed to be that resistance base, but really for your patients as they start to get a little bit taller. We did some work, uh, Dr. Jan and I, with, with really small kids with the flexi sport, and it was a little tough because we just sometimes just couldn't get it to be, you know, and it, it was always a little bit too solid for their size. So the DAFO 3.5 was really where we needed to, where we needed to be at here. Let's take a look at a patient here, Jaden. Uh, cerebral palsy, hemiplegia, pronated on the affected side, left ankle range of motions limited to 90 degrees, had serial casting on the left foot at age of six, wears a night stretching brace, is working regularly with his PT, maintains range of motion when he tends to wear his AFO, and then he quickly loses range of motion when he doesn't wear his AFO. Um, nothing out of the ordinary. We all we noticed that in the room here. Um, what happens here as well is if he stops wearing his daytime AFO, for instance, um, he's going to have a tendency to what? Be up on those, the, the heels up in the air, up on the toes. What did we lose? Tibia advancement. What does tibia advancement do for us? It puts a stretch on the gastric soleus and helps us to maintain range of motion through walking. Current bracing style form is the DAFO Tammy 2, so it's got a plantar flexion block in the brace. Tammy 2 can be free motion or it can be Dorsey Assist. I guess since we're mentioning it, let's go ahead and send that one around as well. Uh, this week at Cascades booth, all of these braces and even some models that you can uh, kind of play with are there as well. So let's send around. This is the traditional DAFO 2, plantar flexion stop, free dorsiflexion. We'll send this one. They're labeled as well as they come around. Here is your, here's a Tammy 2. So this is a free motion. Tammy just means it has that Tamarack type joint in it. I'll send this one this way. Here's your free plantar flexion Dorsey Assist and plantar flexion Dorsey Assist. I'll send this one as well. These are all Tammy 2 models that I'll send around as well. Um, we're trying to preserve with him his ankle dorsiflexion range because that 90 is that big, that big crossroads spot because if we start to lose range of motion, now we've got a big problem and big change in bracing. If we start to gain range of motion, he can start using that to his advantage as well. Um, and then again, trying to get a nice consistent heel strike. Here is his assessment. So we're looking at his R1s versus R2s. Obviously, knee being bent, he'd be looking at soleus versus, versus his gastroc. Um, so the question here is, we're not, we won't spend an entire lecture on this portion, but I do want to mention that, you know, there's a philosophy of, do I set the brace at their R1? So let's say they're minus 10 R1, and let's say they're plus 10 R2. Do I set the brace at three to four degrees of dorsiflexion in line with going with a good R2 range of motion? Or there's a school of thought that people say, well, why don't I put it at minus 10 so when they walk, it doesn't pull on the gastric soleus and give that, that stretch reflex, that, that excitement causing them to want to increase their spasticity with the brace. We tend to work in lines with our R2, but I wanted to mention there's those two philosophies that really exist out there for when you're trying to determine a final end range for, uh, for this, particular, uh, this particular patient here. So as we mentioned, um, for him our goal is to try to get that heel down to hit. Um, I do like in today's world, by the way, the ability for patients to be able to send me a video. All the time I have patients come in the office and I say, I hear this, I say, mom, mom will say, oh, that's not how he, how he normally walks. He say, well, how does he normally, normally walk? So what happens is this. In a clinic sitting, I get a lot of this where they go, all right, if I put my heel down, especially that 10, 11 year old boy, if I put my heel down when I walk, Keith's gonna give me the little guy, the little SMO. If I walk on my toes one time, Keith is gonna give me the tall guy, the AFO. So they start getting kind of, I, always, I like to call those the, the doctor, the therapy visit, kind of a walk type thing. Today's where I really love the fact that they send me now. I get, I get 30 to 60 videos every single week. They're 10 seconds long. They're very quick, they're very easy. Because I just say to the parent, can you do me a favor? I just fit the brace with them. Can you send me a, 
Don't even tell them to just walk. Just, just take a video of them out playing or doing something, picking up something, something from the ground, that type of thing. But we're constantly getting this, this feedback on these patients to see what kind of difference we're making. So if we look at videos next to each other, the brace style, as we mentioned, was a plantar flexion block. Position of the brace was a vertical heel. Um, so good subtalar neutral position. Preventing that midfoot from collapsing. Forefoot was level to the ground. Sometimes you're not going to be able to be so fortunate as to have a level forefoot. Um, and ankle at 90 degrees. Pronation optimizations, we used a soft lateral containment, so to keep that forefoot from going out in abduction, and then extra navicular padding as well uh, is what we were after. So, decreasing spasticity is the next goal that we're looking at. What is their realistic ankle alignment? Make sure you know what's possible for their dorsiflexion ankle range. So checking their R1 and R2 as we've talked about, as we've mentioned. Do they have a negative R1? Do they have a negative R2? Start to use the logarithms with the R1 and the R2. Limited R2 creates an ankle angle versus shank the vertical issue. So they really just don't seat in the brace properly. I see lots of ones that come in the clinic that have extra straps extra pads, extra anchoring, extra inner boots to really one goal, try to force them into a position they really can't go to. So what's the key here is we may have to accommodate and then take that out as time goes on, as they start to, to gain more range of motion or their R1s and R2s um, improve. There is no part in anything I do that involves more of a team aspect than working with a child that has those limited R1s and R2s. Why? Because oftentimes we are guiding and saying, you need to be seeing the spasticity movement disorders clinic. We need to have them evaluate you for some spasticity, and this is the reason why. Because we took your R1 value, and it is a, it's got a big difference between your R2 value and your R2s in the positive, so let's recommend you on to have some things done for decreasing spasticity. Other factors I'm asking is, am I getting out of my brace, for instance? Am I getting a good, comfortable fit? Is the foot well positioned and supported in the correct alignment? Thin, flexible brace with closely fitting plantar surface contours that engage all of the distal nerve endings in the foot. So I'm molding these tone reducing type of uh, mods into the cast. Um, it's not anything, the, the tone reducing mods is not something that, that we as orthotists have uh, put out there. These are the tone reducing mods that were in the, in the, the therapy journals talking about serial casting and reducing spasticity. Um, in the brain injury patient population. But they're pushes that we use to help decrease spasticity. Now, typically, as we mentioned, this is a very, very big team approach here because oftentimes we're augmenting these other modalities. Um, I mentioned at breakfast, some of my, some of my better friends in the, that I consider good close friends are, are the, one of the physicians in the, uh, the Botox clinic, for instance, because we work so closely together. Dr. Jan and myself, we spent so much time together working together with patients and coming up with plans. So we're oftentimes we're, we're working together with, with do we need increased baclofen? Do we need baclofen pump for more global type issues? Um, do they need to be recommended for Botox? Do they need possibly a recommendation to have an SDR, a selective dorsal rhizotomy? Um, it's really where the team approach in spasticity management really shines. Um, ultimately, improving base of support is absolutely our number one goal with our patients working with, with, uh, with cerebral palsy. Trying to get that center of gravity into a base of support. Uh, when the patient's up on the toes, they have what? A very, very small base of support going on, right? The goal is for them, they're very good at it. They will find a way to get their center of gravity. If I get up on my toes, I have to hold on immediately because I've got to keep my center of gravity from falling out of that little space between the ball of my foot and my toes. That is my base of support. The base of support is not that I'm here on both because when I walk, I'm on what? One leg and then transitioning weight, trying to get into that point is what we're looking at. Um, the goal of bracing for the Aquinas patient, we're trying to increase their balance. We want to prevent them from falling. We want to encourage that heel to toe pattern. And again, we're trying to go after preventing any further uh, tightening of the, or shortening, I should say, of the, uh, of the Achilles and the gastric soleus groups or, and or, I should say, the hamstrings as well. Improving base of support, keeping in mind of what we're working with there, plantar flexion blocks or resist bracing. So we're talking about the resisting type of motions. We're talking about trying to bring that heel down as much as possible. Allow as much motion at the joint as possible to achieve the goals. Now, we're going to say this is the, when people ask me, what is the, what's the number one, what, what, what's the best brace for this patient? When I go see a patient in a therapy gym, for instance, they'll say, what's the best patient brace you think for this patient? I start off by saying, least amount of bracing or limitation to give the most amount of function. Now that doesn't mean, let's take a guy that, that's in a crouch gate pattern or he's in a hyperextension and let's put him in an SMO. 
Okay, what it means is the least amount of bracing to give the most function. Okay, so a patient that, that is a, uh, that's going into knee hyperextension. The least amount of bracing to give the most function would not be a solid ankle AFO, right? Do I really need to limit the motion of his dorsiflexion? Maybe, in the sense of if they don't have mid to late stance extension, I may have to resist that with the DAFO Flexi Sport, with the DAFO 3.5. But the first things we're looking at is how do we give them the least amount of bracing and limitation, but still give them the most function in mind of getting that center of gravity into its base of support. Uh, don't forget here as well, sometimes we need to bring the ground up to the foot. Try adding a wedge to the brace or shoe to get full plantar surface contact. Um, it can be internal or, as we mentioned, external. Now, Again, we don't have the time to, be, to go too deep into this, but the, also the question comes down to is, a child that is up on his toes and has tight hamstrings as well, can't get his heels to the ground, right? Because if he does, his center of gravity is behind his base of support. He won't do that. He'll always get his center of gravity in his base of support. The question is, if I brought the heel wedge and I brought it all the way up to his shoe, well, now I'm really in a accommodated position. So what we do with a lot of patients is we'll drop it down a little bit so that the question is, I know he can't get to here, but can he get to there? Just a little bit more. Why? Because then we could be putting a stretch on the hamstrings itself as well. Now, how do we know if that's a good outcome or that's going to work? Basically, what we do is we have the patient, I tell the family, two weeks from now, I'd like you to send me a video that, again, he doesn't really know about. Just take a video of him going somewhere 10 seconds. What am I looking for? If he's carrying the wedge, he's never hitting the ground, well, I just added something that he's carrying that's heavy, that's, that's just there. What I need at that point is to see that that wedge is actually hitting the ground at that point. If it's not, then I truly have to bring the ground up to meet that heel at that point until I gain range at those, those hamstrings. Um, optimizations, uh, again in the optimization uh, handout that you have there, that guide is a wonderful guide. Um, it has all of these different things and how to communicate, how to communicate with the technicians at DAFO. I tend to say, you know, the technicians at DAFO are actually my technicians. Um, I don't necessarily work for DAFO, for Cascade DAFO, but because of the fact that they are making the brace I'm using with my patients, they are my technicians. What this does is it allows us to be able to communicate and say, this is what I'm looking for with this particular patient population. So, next goal here we're looking at is improving functional alignment. So we're trying to hold the muscles and joints in alignment to encourage appropriate flexibility and position the foot and ankle during growth. What are we ultimately saying there? We're trying to protect those joints. Uh, best position of function is what we're after. So again, that vertical heel, level forefoot. Plantar flexion, bra plantar, plantar flexion block brace, so the Achilles and surrounding muscles don't shorten and or develop any kind of uh, type of uh, contractures there. Uh, we want to guard against midfoot collapse. Guard against that pronation using those optimizations or as we mentioned before, using those as solutions is what we're after. How do we decrease energy expenditure for these patients? Okay. Here's a patient here that's a, it's a wonderful video here because what are we looking to do here? We want to decrease energy expenditure to increase his endurance, to reduce his fatigue, ultimately improve his independence. So you can see he's, he's really unstable on the left. And ultimately, what are we doing with the SMOs, with the, with, the, with the posterior strap there with that patient? What are we doing? These are the goals we're trying to gain. But at the end of the day, what we really did is we gave them a really good base of support with, the good, with a good midfoot support and, and, uh, and a better position for him to be able to balance himself in that type of a position. So kind of a review of what we were doing from a bracing goal standpoint is we want to correct foot position, increase range of motion, decrease spasticity, increase base of support, improve functional alignment, decrease energy expenditure. A good overall measure of the outcome of this though is what did you do to the center of gravity and his base of support? What did you do for balance?